Okay, so um, yeah, so we are blockchain web services. Uh, before I actually start, um, we just released an open source explorer. Uh, Michael over there is the one who wrote all of it. Uh, it's open source. It's in Python. It's on GitHub. Um, so if you have any, like, you can play with it. If you have any feature requests, anything you like, don't like. Michael, take any feedback you want. You can see the confidence going up and all that stuff. It's cool, it's really cool actually. And you can, I mean after that it's the standard bug explorer, but you have like confidence factor, minor preference. All right. Is it yeah. just for Bitcoin, your block explorer? You guys oh, sorry, yeah, it's for, uh, where is it? All the coins are at the bottom there. So, so block cipher, blockchain services. So I'll be talking about the scripting language behind uh, Bitcoin, but it's like applicable for most altcoins and even for other blockchain that are more like, I don't know, Ethereum or whatever. Um, the ideas are a lot similar. Um, I'll meet quickly. Uh, so I've done a fair amount of open source. I used to be the uh, VP at Apache. I help projects going in the Apache Software Foundation and kind of getting uh, familiar with open source and all that. Um, I've built platforms and cloud stuff for a while, so that's kind of why we're doing what we're doing too, because that's the kind of only know anything we know how to do. Um, and then I'm the CTO of BlockCypher, and we just raised the money. Um, and so, yeah, and we were built, so my last presentation was mostly about that last part. Uh, so we were built a full uh, Bitcoin node from the ground up uh, to scale to like SaaS uh, cloud style deployment. Uh, so we have to, as you would imagine, we build every single piece, the protocol, uh, the scripting, pool, the blockchain, the like block algorithm, storage, all of that to be able to serve um, a lot of volume and scale, have a lot of redundancy, you no know, single point of failure, all of that. Um, and we expose all of that through APIs and web services. So what I'm going to go over, um, so first, a um, little refresher on Bitcoin scripting, where is it, what it is, what it's for, um, and then, which primitive would you need for an interpreter of a Bitcoin type programming language? Um, and then I'll do a bit of a digression for like a little wider topic on uh, compilers and interpreters, because I mean, after all, it's Bitcoin dev, so I'm sure all of you would find interesting to see how the different compilers and interpreters you're using every day are built. And then um, I'll continue on the interpreter for Bitcoin that we're building during that presentation. So a quick refresher, it's gonna be quick. Um, so like the, the problem sometimes is that in the rooms there's all kind of different levels of knowledge about Bitcoin and everything. So I'll still try to go quick, but still give some sort of uh, overview. So this is a standard uh, to be current transaction uh, setup. So you have like, the transaction on the left, uh, taking 50 bitcoins in, bitcoins in, it has two outputs out, one of these outputs is transferred to the next transaction. Um, for Bitcoin, every single output has to be burned completely, so you can't use just a bit of, like just a fraction of the, the output of the previous transaction, you have to use everything and then set, send change back to yourself. Um, so this has two outputs. You can imagine that the first output on the transaction one, the first output is sending that money to somebody else, and the second output is sending money back to yourself. The second transaction is pending the first output, so you can see the input on the right is pending the output on the left. And then there's other inputs and other output that form the overall transaction. So that's gonna be the most confusing part about the whole talk that you'll have to, like, and I'll have to even uh, keep it in mind when I talk because sometimes I do the mistake. So the, um, it's reversed. The input is pending the output. So that 
kind of sometimes get a lot of confusion. So the uh, input on the right is referencing and spending the output on the left. The output existed first, the input spends it by referencing it and being able to, like, having the right to spend that. How the input actually spend the output, that's going to be the topic of all my talk. So we'll see all of that in detail. So the scripts in those transactions and in both the input and output, this piece of script in both of them, are those spending. The, the scripts need to be executed. If the script ret returns true, that uh, output can be spent. If the script returns false, that output cannot be spent, the transaction is invalid, the whole network is going to drop it. Not, not even relay, not clear. So um, spending a, a Bitcoin transaction is match, uh, matching an older output, which, which has what's called often UTXOs for unspent transaction outputs, with a new spending input script. Um, the input script is often called a script egg, uh, kind of historical because it mostly contains this ECDSS signature. Um, the output is called often the script pub key, but that's kind of a shitty name. Uh, so more the redeem script. Yeah, it's a shitty name because it's, it's also historical. It used to contain a pub key, but it doesn't have a pub key anymore. Now it's a pub key hash, and then depending on what you're doing, if you do multi-sig, it will contain much more complicated stuff. So, um, like, yeah, that's a bad name. Redeem script is better because it's redeeming the previous uh, output. So an uh, input, continuing on kind of uh, laying the ground for the rest. Um, a pair of outputs and inputs is just like a function invocation. Imagine that the output that's getting spent is the function. To be able to spend that output, you have to give parameters that make the function return true. The function is known, but you still have to provide a set of parameters that will make that function return true, and that's the input that you're going to provide to spend it. So, Practically, in a lot of cases, this goes through a signature verification thing where um, the parameters to the function are, are the public key and the signature that will make the function return true. But the, you can like, imagine all kind of function, and that's actually what we're going to do during that talk. Um, so yeah, here you have the classic. You don't need to, like, that's a classic kind of script structure. But the point is, um, the script saying on the left side is trying to spend the redeem script, the redeem script on the right side by providing the right, the right arguments for it. So now, um, the Bitcoin scripting language is a stack-based programming language. Uh, how many people are familiar with stack-based programming language? Have you heard? Like four? Huh? Like yes. Pretty good. All right. So it seems not to reverse polling, Polish notation. Um, there's a long history be behind stack-based programming languages, uh, so forth, in the 70s, and then like a, actually it's Factor, not Factory, okay? Factor, Joy, there's a whole history of them. Um, so that the old force book, which uh, is apparently the third worst book cover of all time. <laughs> there's, there's like a whole classification of book covers, and this one has the price of a pretty bad one. Um, the good thing about stack-based programming languages, they are compact and efficient, and they can be carried around. So it's really easy to have a script, you send it all over, um, you can execute it in a really compact environment. Um, all the stack-based programming languages used to be very popular during the microchips era, just because you could execute it with very, very little memory. Um, and then, um, again, they, they are really short and, and uh, easy to, to port around. Um, they're also easy to implement because you are, the only data structure you really need to, uh, to execute them is a stack. Actually, you will see you need two stacks, but that's about all you need to execute it. There's no like fancy parsing or like VMs or like, even garbage collector or um, anything annoying like that. It's really straightforward. We actually build an interpreter in the talk, so that's like an hour and I'm talking a lot. Um, so for all those reasons, it's a really good fit for something like Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies uh, because you can send it over. A lot of people with all kind of different devices in the world can just execute it really easily. And it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth that like a, a huge program would take to send over. 
So this is a quick example of a stack-based programming language execution. So this is like a, like a fourth like kind of. Um, so it's line by line. You start, so as I was saying, you have two stacks. You start with an empty data stack, and the instruction sa stack has what you want to execute. And as you go down, you pop something out of the um, instruction stack. So in my example, is you're popping from the left, and you push it on the data stack. When it's just a value, you just push the value. When it's an instruction, you do what the instruction is supposed to do. So you start with like popping three, popping three, which goes on the data stack. That's the second line over there. Then dup is a duplication operation, so you end up with twice the same element. So three, three twice. Then mul is a multiplication, so you pop the multiplication. The multiplication will just uh, pop the two elements from the data stack, multiply them, push the result. That's nine. So far, I'm following the multiplication thing. It's good. Um, then uh, ten, you just push the ten. Uh, mean. You just pop the last two elements, get the mean of them, push that, which is nine, and square root, which is the square root of the element. So you pop that element, calculate the square root, push it back. So we went from the top, eliminating one element at each time, and everything goes to the last stack and execute. Also good. So that's a very simple example. Um, so the Bitcoin stack language. So as I was saying, it's embedded in every single input and output. Um, and then to execute it, you just take um, the script that's in the output, put it on your instruction stack, execute it, goes into your data stack. You keep the data stack, you don't trash it yet. Then you take the script from the output, uh, the input, sorry, the input that's gonna, no, sorry, the output, okay. <laughs> Getting wrong, okay. So you take it from um, the input, that's the one that's the parameters for the function, you execute it, ends up leaving some values on the, um, the data stack, then you take the script from the output, which is the function, all right, that's taking those parameters, you execute that, and at the end you hope that it returns true. If it returns false, then Transactions wrong. Um, so each instruction, every, in Bitcoin, everything is a binary. You know, like all the values, everything. The only thing you need to worry about is binaries. You're going to pop binaries, you're going to push binaries. That's all there is. Um, the instruction themselves choose to interpret, uh, interpret and cast the values that are in those binaries. So um, the binary that has zero in it is false. The binary that has one in it is true. But it depends which instruction check it. Of verify will think that it's false and true, but if you do an add, uh, it will think that it's a zero and one. So the instruction is the one that really interpret the values that are in the binary. So same thing, opneg, uh, there will think that that, that binary is actually a number. It's just that the first byte is like a, to the multiply by 256, and then you have the second. Um, string operation exists, you can concatenate, concatenate them and do all kind of thing with them, but it's all disabled, so actually you can't. They, it exists, Satoshi thought about it, but it's been disabled. Um, yes, so that the whole like Ethereum uh, mantra is that it's not um, trying complete, there's no loops. The reason for it is that it was which is a pretty airy problem to have people execute loops um, in a piece of code that you have no control over, and you're just going to take it and, yeah, we're going to execute lo your loops, you have no idea where they're ever going to finish. Um, so Ethereum is trying to solve that. Um, then there's some like, little stack manipulation shortcuts where like, a number will push uh, that many bytes into the stacks and stuff like that, which are just made to make your life easier at, as a script writer and script executor. And then the main thing is uh, the crypto primitives. So of course you have primitives for hashing, um, three or four different ones for hashing, for signing, for multi-sig signing, stuff like that. Uh, the signature ones are the magical ones. So like all the other ones are kind of tractable, like addition, hashing, it's fairly simple. You see like the stack is input the, um, and you operate on that stack, that's fine. Signing is totally like kind of, I put the rabbit out of my hat kind of thing because you, you, the document you sign is actually, is actually the transaction, 
but it's not really the transaction that you have right now because the signature is supposed to fit in that transaction. So it's somewhat self-recursive. So you have to heavily massage the transaction before you can sign it. Um, so like, most, like, the up, like the check signature operation is the most magical of them all. Um, I could talk about it, but that's gonna take 30 minutes just by itself. So maybe at the end of the talk if you want to. Um, all the operations are called opcodes, which is really familiar for people who have done like compiler stuff already. Um, compiler of intermediate representation and um, every operation is called an opcode. It's basically the way to represent an operation as a byte, where you say every single byte and number so and so is this operation. And everything is often represented as hex, so that's the operation hash two fifty six. It's uh, the hexadecimal AA and uh, number one seventy. So, there's only five scripts that are running on the Bitcoin main chain ever in general. So why would you even care about the scripting language, right? Like there's only five scripts. You could just have a type in the transaction and the type says just a signature verification that just uh, embedding a little bit of data. Why, why caring at all? Well, that's what I thought at the really beginning when uh, we just started and I, I said, well, I'll just implement the, 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 script, in, the script interpreter. It's just gonna take a day, right? There's not, nothing much to it. It's just five, five scripts, pretty easy. Well, it turns out it is not. So first is all the transactions that were at the beginning of life of Bitcoin that have all kind of like stupid shit in them. Um, then there's Eligius, which, uh, which mines uh, non-standard transactions. So uh, uh, Eligius is a mining pool and they will mine a lot of the stuff that you will push at them. Not everything, but a lot of the stuff that you push at them. So you, you find on the Bitcoin main chain all kind of transactions that are absolutely nothing to do with the standard ones. And then usually you also want to support testnet. Testnet has like the first six to 700 blocks in testnet are a huge test case. So they, like, and I think for the most part it's Gavin and Rison who tried to exercise it, but anyway, uh, you get all kind of weird transactions trying to test whether um, the, the, the node that will execute them support those like alternative stacks. Um, like, well, or like spending a whole bunch of outputs all at once to see all your, all your implementation with scale and stuff like that. So, and then you have like kind of, if you want to design like the next Ethereum or think you can do better than Ethereum or uh, if you want to just do like something like name card and specialize a language or whatever, then you need to know all those opcodes and then create more and then know how you can create more and how to implement them and all that. So. Now, finally, uh, so we're going to start looking at how you would build an interpreter, a script interpreter in Go that would run the Bitcoin uh, scripting language. Uh, as you'll see, it's actually not that hard, but uh, I'll do a bit digression. So if you want to build that interpreter, what you will need is a stack that can push and pop byte arrays for the most part. Um, some utility functions are needed, but as I was saying, the Bitcoin scripting language is just byte arrays, so that's the only thing that you need to consume and push and get and whatever. Uh, you'll need your whole list of opcodes because you need to read them and know which one are what. Uh, you'll need some helpers to cast stuff, right? So as I was saying, the operations need to cast um, the byte array they're, they're consuming from the stack. So some operation like add will want an int, so you'll have to well, begin practically, but anyway. Um, so you'll need to like, have operations to cast that, boolean, whatever. Then you'll need something to execute the script, which is kind of the main meat, um, which will run after like, uh, operation after operation and just execute all the instruction and everything. And then for each of those uh, opcodes, you'll need a specific implementation for them, like a hash, just run the hashing, addition, just use plus, stuff like that. So let's get started with some code. Uh, so that's just the a Go stack implementation. That's actually the one we use. So that's like, it's production code, people. Um, so uh, I mean, fairly standard. If you haven't seen Go code before, that's what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> it looks kind of so. Oh yeah, maybe I'll go into some detail. Yeah. So. Um, Okay, so the stack, so you can alias standard types in Go, so the type 
uh, so the square bracket binds by array. The square bracket square bracket binds by an array of by array. Um, the nice thing with Go is you can uh, alias standard type. So if you want, you can create your own int type. Or actually, the duration type in Go is just a big number. And just not it, right? Um, the second thing is the length, right? Like the font self type length. So that's uh, a method. Like the way you declare a method, you, you just you just by doing the parenthesis with the, the type here, you're just saying that you're associating that function with that type. So then it becomes a member. And then you can see that everything, pretty much everything is in there. Uh, after that, there's some kind of pointer magic in there. I won't go into too much detail of, but uh, that's fine. Um, and then you can see. Sorry? That was the magic. Well, so here you playing with references when you're replacing an, an existing reference. So here you get the pointer to it, get the length, and then you replace that reference with a new one. So you basically swap the thing that you're supposed to do yourself. Um, and then after that, it's mostly uh, switching the function. So push, push is an element, pop, pops it, and pop two at once. Um, the, um, from int and to int functions here, we'll see after, but the utility to convert stuff. Um, and peak, so you need peak in every single stack implementation and every single parser type thing, because you always want to know what's coming without really looking at it. So that's the full uh, kind of stack implementation, and practically you need two of them. Well, for the instruction stack, you can do with a battery. Um, those are some opcodes. Pretty classic. Uh, I don't know, is there anything? Uh, so push data one, like, so they are Bitcoin opcodes, right? So push data one will push the number of bytes that's in the next byte. Right, so you, you, uh, you check the script, you need to push data one, say, okay, it's push data one, get the next byte. What the value of the next byte? I say it's, I don't know. 80, and then you take the next 80 bytes and you push them on the stack. Uh, NOP is the most interesting of them all, it does nothing. Um, return, re, re, so return, uh, return is actually a, a little bit of a misnomer. So when you think of your standard language, return is return your value. Uh, in Bitcoin, return is about in the script. So when there's a return, execution, uh, script execution stops and the script is deemed invalid. So it's not like return a value. It's just aborting. Um, like drop drops two things, like the two drop drops two things, two du duplicate the last two things. And there's a long, long list of them. There's a, probably around 230 upcodes, something like that, that I used. So return makes the script return like false? Yes, practically yes. Uh, no, so to return true, your script actually have to end with the number one left on the um, the, da the data stack. Okay. So once once the, the your script ends, to know like kind of call it call the result, you just check what's at the top of the stack. The stack doesn't need to have only one, but what's at the top of the stack needs to be one or start with one. Um, okay. So have you seen, we've done some like, casting magic up there, like uh, uh, from end to end, so we're gonna see that a little bit. More code. Like, Tarek told me that I had to do the, the, the talk was supposed to be boring and hard, and still off code. Does anybody know <laughs> so if you're bored, <laughs> Tarek's fault. <laughs> is this too much, is, any, is this too hard for you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's not off, talk, off code, but I don't know. So, um, yeah, so this is standard casting. So, uh, in Go, you have like uh, a byte array to integer, big integer, and big integer to byte array primitives. The problem is they don't, like, in, when you think of a standard byte array, uh, you only necessarily think of negatives, right? And so, they only use uh, uh, positive integers. So, that whole logic is just to handle uh, the, the negative integers, where the first byte will have, like, the, you know, the, the first. Um, bit would be zero or one, whether it's negative or not. Well, I mean, that's a lot of code, just basically if you make a byte array and then it's like multiply by 256 or whatever, the power of two that's right and um, all of that stuff. 
So now I'm going to do a big digression. Because um, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, so because we're talking about interpreters and pilot, well, interpreters in that uh, thing at least, but if you're if your, your problem is um, running, like executing some code that's being sent to you, comes from Bitcoin or comes from your own like future, I want to solve the whole problem of uh, all the problem that Bitcoin has right now and whatever, uh, that's what you have to worry about. So you can go with the stack uh, based language, which would be a good thing to do, but um, there's other solutions. So that's what a pretty straightforward compiler looks like, like say uh, an as assembler compiler. You don't need to do any much parsing at all, like it's straight like code and you have numbers for move and whatever, and you can con uh, convert it to a machine code almost right away. You just need to uh, like call people at Intel to ask them uh, what their machine code sh should look like, and it's pretty straightforward. <coughs> that's what a less straightforward compiler looks like. So. Uh, you get like, the, the, the language interpretation, so you need to lex the language, like see, oh, that's an L, oh, that's a U, oh, that's an A, whatever. Um, and then, so you push that, you say, okay, that's F, O, R, so that's a four, so I'll push something that's a four. And then the parser interprets all those um, sequence instruction, the four, a number, the var, whatever, um, and we'll build structure out of it. Which, are, which is usually a tree. It's actually called an abstract syntax tree. And that's the whole tree of execution of all your, um, your instruction. That will often go for an optimizer. So that's all arguable. You can put the optimizer before, after the assembler. It's often at both places, actually. Um, which will like, go through the tree and prune branches that are unused. Or if you do like a return in the middle of your function, where everything that's after your return can be pruned, stuff like that. And then the assembler goes to machine code again. Um, comp like the Go compiler, for example, closer to that, uh, the um, V8 in um, Chrome would be all closer to that too. So you use Lexer, Parser, Optimizer again. Uh, IR stands for intermediate representation. So the compiler use something in between that's a little close to assembler, but is also a little easier to manipulate. Um, so there's a lot of literature about which to pick and uh, what they should look like, if you need like two instructions, three instructions on the right side, but anyway. Um, so at the, of the optimizer, you build some intermediate, intermediate representation that's much lower level than the language you're, uh, you're starting to parse. Like say if you were parsing JavaScript, the intermediate uh, representation will look, look much closer than the translation of your JavaScript in assembler. And then um, that's chosen because it's really easy to optimize. So it's really easy to go over it, swap instruction, um, change order, all of that stuff. Um, then uh, again, assembler, and you get back to machine code. So that's the, as you continue to work, like real world languages gets much hairier, hairier as you go down the rabbit hole, especially when you have a virtual machine. Um, so you do again, Lexer, Parser, Optimizer, and then you have your uh, virtual machine bytecode. So that's what you feed the virtual machine. And like the whole Java tool chain is based on that, basically. But same thing for .NET, right? But basically, the, the choice of having a bytecode is just being able to have a whole ecosystem of people, like uh, uh, language um, tooling and uh, testing, all of that, that can understand the bytecode, but it's much easier to understand at the high level language, which is well, really hard to understand for machine, um, but it's still fairly optimized. Um, the thing is something like Java, for example, they basically don't really trust their optimizer to do a, um, their uh, optimizer on the client side to do a good job, so they decompile everything. So they just spend a lot of time compiling and then decompile everything to get back to close to your code yeah. so that they can optimize it better when it hits the VM. Um, so you get another like decompiler, another range of optimizer, recompiler, and you have an internal uh, inter uh, intermediate representation. Actually, you have, uh, in the case of Java, you have multiple intermediate representation. Because um, internally, your code will either be interpreted or it will be also compiled on the fly. That's the, J the Java uh, just-in-time compiler, sorry. So one intermediate representation will be 
used by the interpreter and interpreted as is, and it needs its own range of optimization and everything. And another representation of it will go into a just-in-time compiler, which will, which will compile it, put in a machine language, and run it. And that's for the hotspot kind of thing, where the code that's run a lot and slow. The rest can still be um, interpreted. Now, uh, not compiler anymore, but interpreters. Uh, so going to interpreter, as you can see, it's much simpler. That's why uh, people usually in, uh, implement an interpreter first for their like, toy language. If you were to implement like, your own toy language tomorrow, you should probably start with an interpreter to make it easy to, uh, to implement. So you only need to, to care about the lexer, the parser, and then some kind of lower level stuff that you interpret. Some people just interpret directly the, what's the output of the parser, and that's fine, at least to start with. And that's Bitcoin. So because you have a stack language, because it's a binary based uh, uh, stack language, the only thing you need is the interpreter itself. You just get the bytes. Anytime you get a byte, you say, okay, what, is that, that, what does that byte mean? And you run what it's supposed to mean, and that's it. So really easy to implement, and because there's fairly little logic, it's actually really fast. And then you have things like scheme, which are pure magic. <laughs> uh, so now back to our like the interpreter we're we're trying to uh, to implement. So this is the way you shouldn't design an interpreter. Um, it's like it's pretty, right? You have like all oh, classes, it's subject oriented, and you have methods and everything. Nice little get children, and you have a block, and it contains those other restrictions, and maybe it could contain another block, and a block can contain a block that can contain a block, and while is a block, well, not here, but it could be. Um, the problem is that uh, all, like, uh, except, well, even in C, uh, the execution of all that is going to be, well, C, sorry, um, the execution of that is going to be really slow. Because what you have to think about is about any time you call a function, it has to be dispatched. So whatever execution environment, uh, for your code, when you call that function, it has to find the code that's on the other side of the function. Uh, when the code is right there, because sometimes it can be directly in line or whatever, uh, that's really fast. When the code is like that, when, when you got exec, like which exec do you use, right? Like here, are, in an example, there's only five, but in a normal language, like 50 of those things that are all, because like, some blocks have subclasses and whatever. So when you call it, well, you have to check like, what the type of that thing that's called. So small languages do uh, what's called call, si call site optimization, where at the call site, they will say, well, I mean, turns out that the last 10 times you call that thing, it's just that type. So I'll inline it. I'll, I'll assume that it's that type you're going to call. And then if it happens to not be that type, there's like a little failing thing that's like, oh, it wasn't that type. Let's go, let's, let's go back and try again. So that can be really fast. Like, Java does things like that, .NET does things like that. Uh, the problem is uh, when you have like 50 different things, right? It needs to say, well, it can be that, or it can be that, or it can be that, and then do a check um, for each of them. So it basically keeps in memory the code that has that function on the other side all in line. All right, so that's using more memory. If you have 50 of those functions on the other side, you have to inline 50 times this code. So that's a lot of memory. So what most uh, PMs and compilers end up doing is after three or four, they just bail. So that's a typical example where you have much, much more than three or four. So the code is going to be widely unoptimized. So it's going to be dirt slow. So no actual, well, like other than toy interpreters actually implemented this way. What people found is that the old style is always better. So it's just the for loop and the switch, and that's the fastest in interpreter you'll ever find. Um, Lua, actually, they've done a lot of research on uh, how to optimize just that. There's C++ instructions that have been made just to show, just to um, help the compiler so that the switch is going to be just one jump. So after that, your execution is pretty straightforward. Your code is pretty fucking ugly because you have uh, about 50, 60 case statements in there, and it all has to fit in a single file. Uh, but we can make each case 
pretty straightforward. I'm just calling a function and no, like no magic, it's just plain function. So that's what we're doing. So here is what uh, the interpreter actually looks like. That's really close to the code we also have in production, actually. So the buffer at the top, the bytes the buffer is the stack, right, where you're reading the instruction from. Um, and up is the operation. And you just read the byte, which is popping from the stack, basically. Up is the operation. If there's an error where well, you do something about it. Um, and then, depending on the operation, well, you have your big-ass switch. And each operation is just a case. So if you have a zero, you just put the number of zero, or the push data one that I was talking about earlier. Well, you just read the byte, which is popping from the stack, the instruction stack, and then uh, pushing in the stack the number of bytes from the buffer that correspond to that number, like 80 or whatever. Um, the depth just measures the length of the stack, and that's the number you push, the drop that just pops the stack. So good. Some more stuff. Um, uh, so that's a nice little uh, go idio uh, idiom at the top with the rotation. So basically, you're rotating the three last element from the stack, right? So you pop through at once, and then you just shuffle them, or revert them. So go as multiple uh, assignment thing, right? Like uh, you can do a, an equal, like a destructuring assignment, but anyway, uh, where you can um, get more than one variable out of a return function. And then you push it back shuffled. Uh, add is really straightforward. You just uh, pop and casting it to an end. And you push back the addition. Max, pretty straightforward. And then, yeah, so that's the first one of the mo uh, most simple um, crypto operation on Bitcoin, which is calculating the SHA of the thing that's at the top of your stack. So you just pop it. Uh, if it's some length zero, you just like push, you don't compute the hash of zero. So you just push a, a, an empty byte, right? And then um, you calculate the SHA, if not, and then you push your SHA back in the stack. That's about it. So that's the whole <laughs> the tests. Yeah. Um, so that's the whole thing about um, interpreter and how you interpret your uh, your language. So stack based again, the stack based. Programming languages are really interesting in that context because, again, you can pass them, they're really compact. And pass the, the, the code for it, they're really compact. Um, they can be executed in all kind of environment. They used to be in, uh, um, executed in microchips, so um, really easy running, low barrier to entry kind of uh, language choice. Um, we checked a little bit more the, the landscape of compiler and, and interpreter and how to build a fast interpreters. Um, and then, so you have to think like uh, when you think of all the design decisions that have been made to Bitcoin. Well, I mean, the, the really interesting thing about it is like a good set of really good uh, design decisions. So you have like the blockchain itself, crypto, and um, some things about the binary protocol and whatever. But even even the Bitcoin language is actually pretty solid. I mean, you don't have for loops, but there's a lot of issues with it. But as far as the, the language choice and how it's designed and how it was structured, it's still pretty good. And then Scheme and Lisp will still be here in 2,000 years. That's it. <laughs> a little fast, maybe? Well, I guess. A lot of questions. Um, questions? Uh, okay, go for it. <laughs> um, so, what are some examples of applications of using block cipher? Um, so, we have um, like users of all uh, traits, kind of. So, it goes from the most classic one, where it would be uh, a wallet or an exchange or a merchant processor. So, we have like, different types of wallets. 
the merchant processor of this particular geographic area, country, so like a Europe, we have a couple in Asia and whatever. Um, exchange, same thing. Um, the exchange of um, like, you know, Singapore. Um, and then there are also like, games, like betting games kind of thing. Um, there are um, yeah, registries, like the, you know, like one name, the Dioke type of thing. Uh, what else? Analytics. Analytics, yes. Um, just like people who push a whole like, bunch of data from us and try to analyze the, the, how many moves and, uh, or like statistics about how the transaction is made or whatever. Um, uh, block Explorer. <laughs> um, yeah, so all kind of different. Use cases, they're like a reward based application where when you do something, you get your Bitcoin rewards depending on your location or whatever. Uh, I don't know, there's a wide array of different stuff. That's the interesting part is right now there's a lot of uh, different cases and we have like a uh, XRP um, uh, gateway that just started recently. Um, to do all the getaway between like, different coins and different currencies and whatever, um, yeah, what kind of applications, yep. Uh, two testing questions. How did you test that your uh, implementation of scripts was the same as the traditional Bitcoin server? And also, at a more detailed level, how, do you know, how did you know that your crypto was good? Crypto okay, so... Uh, for the testing of the scripts, um, there's several stuff. So you can do the, cl the classic unit test, right? You like, test all your instructions and you check that the output seems to match what you fed it. Um, then, as I was saying, the Bitcoin testnet is actually pretty good. When you, you can uh, populate the whole Bitcoin testnet or at least uh, like even more than the 600 blocks. But if you get to like the first 15,000 blocks, uh, that exercises a lot of uh, an exp uh, uh, a lot of the code, and you'll see really quickly. Uh, after that, there's a few ca uh, caveats to that because there's some stuff that's been added a little after. Um, so you kind of have to like again do a little more unit tests on those and compare. It requires a, requires a lot of reading of the Bitcoin Core standard code too because there's bugs that exist there, um, like the quote quote famous one is a multi sig operation that has a random byte at the beginning just because there was a bug and you kind of have to re re replicate that bug. Um, there's like the hashing uh, when you use the Cgash uh, any I think uh, where I mean there's the same thing like there were bugs bug there that you just have to replicate so um, yeah like Unit testing, integration testing with some of the blockchains. Um, there's also, um, so I forget his uh, real name, but uh, his uh, nickname is the Blue Mat. He has on his GitHub, he has a, a test suite that tries to show all sort of uh, pathological transaction IO code. Uh, so that's pretty useful too. And then for the crypto, um, well, so Go is actually pretty good for that. Um, because it's um, like it's pushed by Google, right? They use it a lot internally. So they have really pretty good crypto primitive, an exhaustive set of good pr crypto pr primitives that have a pretty good ECDS library. And then you know it's gonna be reviewed by a team of, of people whose security is the job. Um, and so for that reason, um, it was also a decent choice. It's not like a, a ghetto language that people would have implemented their own crypto on the back of an envelope or something. Thanks. Yep. Is the scripting performance um, a critical part of the performance of the application? Um, there are a lot of different... Uh, so yes and no. So practically in most actual scripts, um, the bottleneck is going to be the signature checking. But then um, there's tricks. Like the signature checking, you can cache it. Because you, you will see the same signature check twice, right? When you get the unconfirmed transaction, when you see the block. 
um, so you can sort of not do it in the second time. Um, so that's one trick. Uh, the other thing is you will see people sending scripts that are really there to, to try to make your script execution real slow. So you will see scripts where people like send a whole bunch of the most compact operation they can put, but also the most expensive one, and we'll try to compute a whole bunch of SHA, for example, on uh, zero value. So you kind of need to, well, like do a whole bunch of ifs, like an if inside an if inside an if inside an if inside an if, and then you see them. Um, so there's all kind of, like, you need to have uh, a performance script executor just for those cases. It's uh, similar to what I was saying at the beginning is that, well, I mean, for the most part, there's only five types of scripts are executed. So why do you even bother, right? You can just extract the script type, like the, it's just most script, you can check their type in just like three or four different comparisons. You say, if byte at this position is so, and byte at this position is so, then it's this script type. And then uh, you don't need to execute anything. Um, but turns out you actually do because there's all kind of different operation and you still need to validate those transactions and validate the blocks because they're part of the blockchain. So it's the same kind of thing where you actually still need to have a fairly fast interpreter. Otherwise, sometime implementation will just grab, uh, grind to a halt and your whole process will go at 99% CPU for uh, 20 minutes if you haven't thought about it. Yeah. Yep. Oh, uh, so the script, uh, like, uh, um, uh, P2 script hash is one type, like, P2, uh, P2 pubkey hash, P2 pubkey. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm, what I'm saying is, okay. Um, let's see. So, I have actually some, I can type. Um, so, Bitcoin has uh, practically only five types of scripts that are standard. Okay, um, so there's only five different types of scripts that uh, a normal node will accept at all. Otherwise, the script will be dropped. Um, so there's that script, which is called pay to pubkey hash. That's a standard script where you have an address, like a Bitcoin address, and you just verify that um, that script works with a signature. So you, the signature will pass in the future, and when that signature is provided, and it validates, again, the public key that's also provided in the transaction, then you're able to, um, so that's number one. Um, that's still the same. Then the pay to pub key, that's just kind of the same thing, but it uses directly the public key, and for historic reasons, kind of abandoned, because you have to put your public key straight in the transaction, it's not hashed, and in case ECDSA is broken, um, putting your, pub your public key right there might be a problem. So that's number two. Um, return. Yeah. I hope I have time. Um, return is just a way to embed some data on the blockchain. Uh, multi-sig, the standard multi-sig, like it's the same as the other one, but it's uh, validated several signatures at one, the escrow type thing where like, you and I both need to both sign that transaction in order for us to spend the money. And then, that's five, good. There's Pedro script hash, which is like the fancy um, multi-sig way. So those five scripts, those five shapes, are the only one that uh, a normal node will accept at all. Otherwise, the transaction are just that one. Yeah. So the, the standard Bitcoin software won't relay any transaction except for those five types of scripts, but it will relay a block that has those? That's correct. Uh, yes, so uh, the, the block validation, you, you can say it as the block validation is a little more lenient as the actual transaction validation. Uh, another way to say it is that there's a certain uh, trust for the miners, and so whatever the miners propagate, um, the network will have a higher level of acceptance for it. It kind of makes sense in some way because, uh, well, it can make sense and doesn't make sense. But uh, if a miner has made all that work to publish a block, you don't want to be uh, an annoyment and just say, no, your block is mean, a pretty good block, but I don't like it because there's that transaction in the middle of it. Right? Um, it's an expensive refusal type of thing. So I guess there was like a don't be a dick kind of thing with the blocks. 
Um, yep. Can you say something about your um, decision to implement it in Go? And did you start with the same application and translate to Go, or was it always Go? Uh, no, so we, st we started in Go from the beginning. Um, so there wasn't that much choice, right? So um, things like Ruby and Python, they're good languages, but for that kind of project, you need, there's, there's all kind of a profile, right? So you need raw IO uh, type performance. So you need good IO support, but you also need raw CPU power like to run the scripts. Uh, to do signature validation and all of that. So after that, you could say, eh, ah, just do it in Ruby, and then you'll have a whole bunch of C code, and then the C code will take care of it. Uh, the point is, like, when you end up with that kind of implementation, little by little, you end up having more and more of your CPU bound code that's in the foreign language compared to your main code. And that's really like, a pain in the ass to manage and to uh, maintain. Um, so practically, Codes that have good uh, I/O performance and good CPU performance, there aren't that many. Your Java or Scala would have been another good choice, but uh, I don't really like Java anymore. I used to do a lot of it. Uh, I think from a um, uh, productivity standpoint, it's not that good. Um, so yeah, for all those reasons, Go was kind of the only one left. Yeah, it's a little more functional too. Yes, yeah. So for, well, like object-oriented programming languages are very kind of, um, they want objects everywhere and classes everywhere. Sometimes it's, it's nice to have simple functions. Um, not all the time, really. It's always like a, a balance type of thing, but um, passing functions around and stuff like that. No, well, you can do that nowadays. Like now with Java, but didn't used to be the case. Uh, so for testing, what's really good about Go is, so there's interfaces that kind of uh, similar as Java interfaces or like, uh, like just basically which is functions, a set of function signatures with no implementation. <coughs> but you don't need to say that your implementation implement the interface. It's all magic. Like Go will say, we'll know that uh, that implementation fits that interface because it has the same set of function with the same, same signature. So there's a lot of decorrelation between uh, interfaces and implementations. And it's really good for mocking. Because you can provide a mock to anything that uses an interface. And you don't need to like, do annoying injection factory factory type of thing. Um, you just pass the, the, the implementation. It's all good. Yeah, it's, uh, you wrote some factory factory over there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Christian, over there. Uh, uh, so, uh, why not just go to BTCD? I guess you guys literally just want to build your own in house implementation. And well, so. So we looked at BDCD where we use a couple like utility package type of thing. But so BTCD has been re-implemented almost exactly like Bitcoin Core. Um, so it's also very much a single process. Uh, I run it on my like a single server or on my laptop kind of thing. Um, like local database and whatever. Um, so it has, it has some like interesting little components to reuse. And in some ways, it, it's been well written for that reason too. It's like it's, you can reuse small parts and build your library on top of it or whatever. But first, the goal was to build an implementation which was optimized for SaaS type deployment for like wide scale, no single point of failure, high, re high redundancy kind of thing, uh, where we have total control over the persistence layer and we're going to throw a lot of denormalized data at it, right? Like we get some data and then we calculate a whole bunch of shit out of it. And that's when we end up saving. Um, and then we wanted to kind of decorrelate, say, the peer-to-peer -peer code, like all the parts that does all the, the connection to other peers and get the data in, be able to like, put them everywhere on the planet and be able to connect and get um, a relay from like, uh, Japan or US or Europe. And then um, have also a web front, front end that was kind of decorated in case of like, a, like all our web front end crashes, say, we can still process blocks and uh, transactions. Um, and then same thing for like the blockchain itself, the pool, all of that. So for that reason, um, 
the lower level stuff in BTCD was interesting, but not all the, all the rest. So yeah, that's why we ended up rewriting most of it. Yep. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what happens if you have an outstanding transaction uh, and it's included in the blockchain? Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, so a non-standard transaction will get accepted as a part of a block, but the transaction itself, will, uh, well, the block actually will get rejected with the transaction that's in it. Uh, so there's hard, it's kind of hard limits, soft limits, right? So there's hard rules, soft rules. So some hard rules are like, um, like, zero, like zero fee on a transaction that's supposed to have fees. And it's, it's after that, there's a complex rule that make it why it's supposed to have fees, but oh, actually, no, that's not true. Sorry, that's a non-relay, bad example. Uh, like max money thing. So um, output has a money value that's, that there's a max of what an output is allowed to have as value. Um, if you go above that max, then the transaction will be refused. And even if it's part of a block, it will be refused. So that's, that's an example of, of rule like that. Or if a transaction is invalid, it has like five outputs, but declares to have 20, um, things like that. So those will, like, the block is invalid. It's considered a bad block. So it won't be accepted. But things like having uh, a script that runs fine, but is not uh, a standard one, will still be accepted as part of a block. So have that script, for example. So that's a password locking type of script, where basically you say, uh, like the, so the output up there, um, just verify that you can pass something that check that hash. So the script just verify that you can provide a value that will hash to that thing there. Um, so that's, that's a password type thing, because you just need to have provide the quote quote password that the hash will. So that's an invalid, like no block, uh, no, um, no peer will relay that, but inside a block it will be fine. It's a bad idea, by the way, to do that. Um, just because somebody can just, the moment you post cash for transaction, everybody will know your password. So after that, it becomes kind of a race. Um, but so, <coughs> yeah. So after that, you have rules that will cause the like, a signature that doesn't match. Like, no matter what, if the signature doesn't, doesn't match, the blocks will be refused. Um, even though the transaction, like, it's already inside a block. So there's sets of rules, and they're kind of, some are historical, some are for good reasons. It's like, a, you kind of need to be compatible with it. Like, in the, uh, in the, Bitcoin can be also explained as a consensus algorithm where you have all these peers across the world and you need to reach a global consensus. And if you can't reach that cons consensus, then sorry, you, you like the isolated peer. Or the worst case scenario is that half of the world, and that's happened before, right? half of the, well, not half, but a big part of the world uh, has one side of the consensus and the other has the uh, other side of the consensus. And that what breaks Bitcoin um, or cryptocurrency in general, the blockchain. Um, but for the most part, as long as consensus is widespread, everybody will be fine. So you get a whole bunch of consensus rules in there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so I don't know if you already explained it, but um, so why do you have to have the Go implementation as opposed to just using like Bitcoin the implementation of the scripts? Um, so that's kind of similar to uh, what I was answering earlier is that, so Bitcoin Core is very much made to run, so and there's all kind of reasons. But, so Bitcoin Core is uh, very much made to run, well, so historically, right? It was written by Satoshi, written for him and his uh, other crypto friends so that they could run it and exchange some transaction and see that it works, right? Uh, I ended up putting, because I needed the wallet, right? So I ended up putting a wallet in there and then I ended up putting some mining code in there because they need to mine their own blocks, right? Um, and then it's kind of that implementation that has everything in it and can run on fairly low-level hardware, right? Like you can run it on your laptop. I mean, it's gonna, like, you, you won't be able to use your laptop much, but it's at least gonna run on your laptop. From our standpoint, we have to have, like, a hundred of customers across the world that can 
consume as much data as they want and do all kind of crazy stuff, or we want them to do all kind of crazy stuff, right? Like we want to allow potentially crazy uh, use cases. Um, and then for that, we need to have a really good level of redundancy so we're always on, right? Like uh, if we lose um, part of our infrastructure, the rest has to continue running and all of that stuff. And then um, we can't say, like, lose a node and have to wait two days for the blockchain to re-download. Um, so, I mean, you can do backups, but that's also tricky. The, the, everything, everything has its own bag of, um, of issues just because it hasn't been thought for that kind of usage pattern. So that's kind of the main, yeah, the main reason behind it. And then after that, we can do some more interesting stuff. That's, so we could have forked Bitcoin Core uh, for some of our usage patterns, but then we'd be a whole mess too, so yeah. That's kind of the... Cool, then have that be the last question. Matthew, thank you so much.